This evening, we're continuing our overview of the New Testament book titled Acts. And here in Acts chapter 20, we find Paul. He's beginning to wrap up his third missions trip. And as we explore the events that are found in this chapter, we're also going to find Paul presenting us with a basic snapshot of his apostolic ministry. And as we examine this snapshot summary of Paul's leadership example, I think that we're also provided with a pretty good picture of what Christian leaders ought to look like. Well, with this as our focus, I'd like us to begin to make our way through Acts chapter 20. If you would look with me, beginning there at verse 1. There Luke writes, After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Now here in these verses, we find Paul, he's beginning to wrap up this third mission trip. And as he prepared to depart from this region, we find Paul here demonstrating two qualities of a Christian leader. First of all, we should notice again there in verse 1, there we find Paul embracing the believers in Ephesus. This word embrace, well, it's translated from a word which was used to refer to the loving hug and the holy kiss that was commonly demonstrated by close friends there in this culture. If you've ever been over to the Middle East, then you'll see people greeting one another in that way. A lot of hugs, a lot of kisses on the cheek. It's a a, a very uh, demonstrative way to to show someone that you're happy to see them. We're, We're not as... Uh, I, I, I guess uh, as huggy here. I remember uh, uh, in Dallas here recently, I saw a friend that I hadn't seen in a while and, and we shook hands and I went in for the side hug and he just kind of pulled back like, you know, I'm not a hugger. And it's just like, well, you're lost because I hug like a big teddy bear. So he was a little uncomfortable and then I was uncomfortable and it was just kind of weird. But here we find that Paul was a hugger. He embraced these people there uh, in this area. They probably even kissed each other on the cheek. And I have to tell you that Jeremy tried that on me the other day, and I just said, I'll go for the hug, but, but, but no kisses, Jeremy, thanks. Now, as we consider the way that Paul embraced these believers there in Ephesus, he helps us to see that Christian leadership, it must be based on a holy love for God's people. There are some people who come in, and they're just kind of like, you know, keeping everyone at a distance. They're, they're keeping everyone at arm's length. And, 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 you know, I think that we should be a church that embraces one another like Paul. And certainly leaders should be those who, who are ready to embrace one another with this sort of holy love. Well, not only do we find Paul embracing these believers, but there in verse 2, we find him encouraging the believers in Macedonia. And it'll help us to understand that this word encourage here in our text, it's translated from a Greek word which was used to refer to the speech that that would strengthen, instruct, comfort, and admonish others. And so based on Paul's example here, we can see that Christian leaders are those who should be spending time strengthening and instructing, comforting, and admonishing the people that they're leading. And that's exactly what Paul was doing here. Not only that, but according to Paul's example, Christian leaders should also seek out those who can share in the work. With this in mind, if you would look with me, there at verse 4, there Luke tells us that Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secondus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now, here in these verses, we find these seven men who were serving alongside of Paul. We aren't told specifically what these men were doing, but I can imagine that they were helping Paul. They were taking care of some of the practical things that needed to be taken care of in order for ministry to take place. They were probably seeking out places to stay, and they were making travel arrangements, and they were just there supporting Paul as Paul was accomplishing this ministry. Now, based on this, I think that Paul was a leader who fully understood that everything is awesome when you're part of a team. I think that he grasped that truth. 
And so he welcomed those believers who wanted to support him. He, he welcomed them to be part of his team so that he could go out and accomplish the work that God had given him to do and yet not bear the full load himself. From his example, I want to point out that good Christian leaders are happy to share in the work. I have seen some leaders who they, they themselves see the work as a misery. They see the work as something that should be dreaded, and so they don't want to give that to anybody else because they feel bad. They feel bad that anybody else would have to bear the burden that they bear. And it's just like, come on, get over it. It's a privilege to serve the Lord. We have to be giving ministry opportunities away. From Paul's example, he was happy to give these men opportunities to serve the Lord. He wanted to give the privilege of serving the Lord to these seven men. And not only was Paul this loving encourager who was happy to work with others, but he was also a leader who was committed to his Christian fellowship. With this in mind, if you would look with me, beginning at verse 7, there Luke writes, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Now, here in these verses we find Paul. He's <clears throat> meeting with the church there in Troas. And we learn that this meeting was on the first day of the, uh, of the week, which means that this church meeting was on Sunday. One reason for this was based on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ actually rose up from the grave on the first day of the week. Therefore, Sunday was considered to be the Lord's day. It's also interesting to note that many Greeks began to refer to Sunday as Kyriaki, which means Lord's day. They would call Sunday Kyriaki, or Lord's day. This title was probably based on the Greek words that John used in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, when he declared, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Those two Greek words put together becomes Kyriaki. Well, I should also point out here that John also tells us in the 20th chapter of his gospel that Jesus met with his disciples on the first day of the week. And so after the resurrection, Jesus went and met with his disciples on the first day of the week or the Lord's day. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, we find Paul instructing Christians there in Corinth to take up a financial collection on the first day of the week. Now, based on all of this, it seems obvious to me that the church was already meeting on Sunday there in the mid-first century. And in support of this position, I'll point out that the ancient Christian work, which is called the Didache, this was written before 130 AD, and it tells us that the church would meet on the Lord's Day of the Lord. That's interesting terminology. They would meet on the Lord's Day of the Lord. They were meeting on Sunday. And during this time, uh, the believers would gather together, and according to the Didache, there on Sunday, they would break bread and celebrate communion together. They were doing church together. Now, there are, are those in our time period who insist that the Christian who worships on Sunday rather than on the Sabbath or Saturday, they're actually breaking Sabbath law. Maybe that's something that you've struggled with. Maybe you have a friend or a family member who's told you that you ought to be you know, going to church on Saturday because that's according to the Sabbath law. Now, if this is something that you've struggled to understand, then I'll simply remind you of the fact that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. He's the one who said, hey, come to me, I'll give you rest. Right? Paul in Hebrews even told us that, hey, Joshua promised another day of rest. In other words, during the age of, of law, you could sit there in the promised land as a good Jew, on the Sabbath, sitting in a lawn chair, eating some gefilte fish, and not working at all, and still not be in the rest that was promised to us. Paul pointed to yet another day, and in that he was pointing to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. Therefore, those of us who have placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, which he accomplished on the cross, we have entered into our Sabbath rest. When I got saved at the end of 1995, I entered into my Sabbath rest, and I've been in my Sabbath rest ever since then, every day of the week. Well, now we corporately celebrate the Sabbath rest of our Savior on Sunday, and the reason why is because this is the day that our Savior conquered the grave providing us true rest. 
The true day of rest is found in Jesus Christ because he's given us rest from the law, from death, and from anything else that would keep us from the grace of God. Well, not only that, but Paul was clearly in support of Christians gathering together on Sunday. And we find that here in our text tonight. In order to prove my point, I want to jump ahead real quick to look at the end of verse 16. There at the end of verse 16, Luke tells us that Paul was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. From this, we see that Paul was in a bit of a rush here. He had a goal to make it to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. We aren't told specifically why, but, but we know that he had a travel plan and that he was trying to get there at a certain time. But now, as we consider the rush that he was in, let's back up and look at verse 7 again, because there Luke writes, now on the first day of the week, that being the Lord's Day or Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So he's in a hurry. He's trying to make it back to Jerusalem by the day of Pentecost, but he's unwilling to travel on Sunday because he wants to meet with the church. The next day is a, a good day to travel because I don't want to miss out on going to church and being with the Lord's people on the Lord's day. Paul, who was in a hurry, pushed the departure date out one day so that he could meet with his brethren there in Troas. What this tells us is that Paul was not only a leader who went to church on Sunday, but he was also a leader who was willing to delay his departure so that he could spend time at church. And listen, Paul wasn't the sort of Christian who was last to arrive and first to leave. No, instead, he taught the believers until midnight, all the while knowing that he was traveling the next day. He wasn't like, oh, sorry guys, gotta go, gotta get up early tomorrow and catch a boat. No, he was there all the way to midnight teaching. Paul was clearly a Christian leader who was committed to the church and he was committed to the equipping of the saints. As a matter of fact, you could say that he discipled people to death. I guess you'll see what I mean by that. If you would look with me there at verse 9, there Luke writes, And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep, much like some of you right now. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story, and was taken up dead. This guy got discipled to death. This guy, Eutychus, he, he's, he's falling asleep during Paul, Paul's Bible study. And, and to be fair to him, we have to remember, it was about midnight when this happened. I mean, come on. Paul had been teaching for hours and hours. And it was midnight. The kid was tired. And he just kind of fell asleep. Unfortunately, this Bible study was happening on the third story rooftop deck of the house. They were up on this rooftop porch, and he went over the side, fell three stories. And we learned that the young man died from this fall. Now, in light of this, if you're prone to falling asleep during Bible studies, be warned. Be warned. You might want to take some necessary precautions to avoid falling out of your chair or drooling on your clothes or something. But seriously, after this boy died, Luke tells us that Paul stopped his study so that this young man might be healed. With this in mind, look with me beginning at verse 10, because there Luke tells us that Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he'd come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Here in these verses we find Paul, he's rushing to the side of the recently deceased man. And it's interesting to note here that, that while Luke tells us there in verse 9 that Eutychus fell down from the third story and was taken up dead, Paul tells us there in verse 10 that the life of this young man was in him. So which one was it? Did he die when he hit the ground? Or was his life still in him? Some might argue that, well, chances are the boy really didn't die. And yet it's important for us to remember that Luke, who's writing this account was a physician. Now, I would think that this physician named Luke would know the difference between dead and not dead. I'm going to guess that he had a pretty keen knack for knowing these things. And he tells us here in the text that the boy died. And yet Paul goes down, lays on him, prays over him, and then says, hey, the boy's life is in him. 
clearly God did something supernatural. This young man was dead, and then the Lord used the great faith of Paul to restore the life of this young man. Then after the life of Eutychus was supernaturally restored, Paul just simply returns to his study and continues teaching till daybreak. I mean, that is just incredible. Yeah, just uh, prayed for that guy, brought him back from the dead by the power of God. Let's get back to the study. I love it. What a leader. As we consider Paul's example, we can see that Christian leaders should be those believers who are so filled with the faith of God that they don't mind putting their neck out there to say, hey, we're going to pray for healing right now, and we're going to seek the Lord to do something supernatural. And if he does, he does, and if he doesn't, well, that's his will, and and we're just going to believe him either way. That's the kind of faith that Paul had. And much like Paul, I believe that Christian leaders, we shouldn't hesitate to ask God to accomplish supernatural miracles. I remember at the Houston conference, I have a friend down there who uh, his, his back was really messed up after lifting a heavy object, and, and he was just in pain. I just said, well, let's just pray. And I laid hands on him right there, and I prayed over him, and we asked God to just restore his back, and boom, he was just like, the pain's gone. It was just amazing. I believe that God is still in the business of accomplishing miracles, and I believe that leaders should take that step of faith to say, let's pray for this, and let's see what God says. Well, not only that, but Christian leaders should also recognize the importance of raising up more leaders. And with this in mind, look with me, beginning at verse 13, because there Paul declared, then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when, when he met us at Assos, We took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite of Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. The next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost." From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Now here in these verses, we're reminded that, that, that Paul had some time constraints here in his travel plans. He's heading back to Jerusalem. He wants to be there on the day of Pentecost. But before leaving this area, he wanted to encourage the leaders at the church there in Ephesus with some final words. And he wanted to do this without actually returning to the highly volatile area of Ephesus. So Paul landed there in Miletus, and he sent some of his guys, some of these seven dudes that he was traveling with, he sent them back to Ephesus to retrieve the elders from the church there in Ephesus so that they could come and meet him in Miletus. And there in Miletus, Paul presents these leaders, these elders, with a lesson which was based on his example. But this is our focus. If you would look with me, beginning at verse 18. There Luke tells us that when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Here in these verses, Paul was reminding these elders there in Ephesus that he was a leader who was willing to suffer many tears. He was a leader who was willing to suffer many trials so that he could call every person to repentance, regardless of whether they were Jewish or or Greek, it didn't matter. Paul was there to call people to repentance and to turn from sin towards God so that they might place their faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, hey, I I, I walked in humility, and I was willing to to take the lumps. I was willing to roll with the punches. I was willing to suffer loss for the sake of the people here in Ephesus. And he's not boasting. He's not bragging. He's not saying, hey, look how awesome I am. But rather he's saying, this is how you should be. As elders over the church in Ephesus, this is the kind of leader that you should be. 
And based on his example, I would argue that every Christian leader should have a heart for reaching the lost just like Paul had. Those who are elders in the, ch- in the church should follow Paul's footsteps by passionately preaching the gospel message, message of repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. This ought to be the ready message that every Christian leader has on the tip of their tongue. And listen, not only did Paul remind them about his heart for reaching the lost, but he also described his complete commitment to accomplishing the Great Commission. As a matter of fact, look with me beginning there at verse 22, because there Paul declares, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping the elders at the church in Ephesus to understand that he was so entirely committed to his calling in Christ that he was willing to suffer the chains and the tribulations that he knew were waiting for him in Jerusalem. And he's saying, hey, I don't really know exactly what's going to happen to me there, but I'm pretty sure it's going to end with chains. I'm pretty sure it's going to end with imprisonment, and and so it did. Now, he could have had this spiritual sense about what was about to happen to him in Jerusalem, and he could have said, well, I'm not going there. (laughs) Knowing the, the tribulation that awaits me in Jerusalem, I'm heading the other way. I'm not going back to that crazy place. Or he could have headed back to to Jerusalem grumbling and complaining the whole way. Well, God, I guess if i got to go suffer for you. Can't you imagine him just grumbling and complaining because of the trouble and the trials that were about to come upon him? But that's not what he did either. We learn here that he was returning with haste to Jerusalem with joy. I love that. He was returning to Jerusalem with joy, and Paul presented these elders with this correct example by assuring them that he was committed to finishing his race with joy. Regardless of the personal cost, regardless of the torture, regardless of the suffering, Paul was completely dedicated to continue testifying to the gospel of the grace of God. I love that attitude. He he wasn't focused on the suffering. He wasn't focused on the tribulations or the trials. He was focused on the finish line. He set his sights on the finish line, and he said, I'm going to run my race, and I'm going to run it with joy. Based on Paul's example, it seems to me that Christian leaders should be so completely committed to our calling in Christ that death is more desirable than disappointing the one who saved us from the punishment we deserve. That we would much more desire death than to disappoint our Savior. And as our desire to serve the Lord overshadows our desire to even live, then we can look at the tribulations that await us and declare, none of of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. Are you running your race with joy or are you grumbling about every trial and every tribulation that comes your way? I'm here to tell you that you can run your race, grumbling and complaining, and you can still be heading in that lane that God has given to you, but if you're not doing it with joy, then you're missing out. If you're grumbling and you're complaining about the tribulations that are in front of you, what kind of example is that to everybody else? The Lord would have us to run our race with joy, even if there's suffering involved. We should run our race with joy, with joy, and the only way to do that is to focus on the finish line, to stay focused on that finish line and the trophy that we're going to receive once we cross it. You stay focused on that, you can deal with the pain. You can deal with the trials and the tribulations because you're focused on the prize. Furthermore, Paul also helps us to see that Christian leaders should be committed to the truths that are in God's word. And with this in mind, if you would look with me beginning at verse 25, because there Paul declares, and indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. 
Here in these verses we find Paul, he's professing his personal innocence from the blood of all men. And this is not to suggest that, that Paul had never sinned. It's not to suggest that Paul uh, you know, did ministry perfectly every single day. It's not what he was saying. No, instead, Paul was simply innocent of the blood of all men because he had clearly presented the whole counsel of God to all of the people there in Ephesus who would listen to him. He didn't go and present half-truths. He, he didn't go and, and withhold some information. No, no, he presented the whole counsel of God. And therefore, he could say, hey, look, I told you what you need to know. Now my hands are clean of your blood. Based on this, Paul seems to be suggesting here that the Christian leader who wants a clear conscience before God, the Christian leader who wants to be innocent of the blood of all men, must not only embrace all of the applicable truths of God's word, but we must also be committed to presenting these truths to the people that we've been called to minister to. The Lord isn't calling Christian leaders to present some of the pertinent information found in the Bible, but all of it even the tough doctrines that people don't really want to hear. This is one reason why I'm personally committed to teaching through the Bible line by line, verse by verse. I, I don't have the, 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 the right to pick and choose which verses I'm going to teach. I'm not even smart enough to do that. I just want to take a book. We're going to work through the book. We're going to take the whole counsel of God in context what it says, it says. Doesn't mean we necessarily have to like what it says, but let God be true and every man a liar. Accept what it says because that is God's truth for us. We need to embrace the truths of God's word, and not only that, but we must declare the truths of God's word. I would argue that every good Christian leader should be committed not only to embracing these truths, but teaching the full counsel of God. And when we pick and choose which verses we want to teach, well, it's real easy to skip over doctrines that a lot of pastors are happy to just avoid. Not Paul. Paul said, I'm going to teach the whole counsel. And that's what every good Christian leader is going to commit themselves to, teaching the whole counsel of God. Not only that, but Paul also encouraged the elders from Ephesus to become shepherds who are also protecting the flock from false doctrines. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me, beginning at verse 28, because there Paul declares, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day with tears. Here in these verses we find Paul encouraging these elders to serve in their church as spiritual shepherds. And he told them to do this by guarding the members of their churches from the ravenous wolves who were going to try and deceive those whom the Lord purchased with his own blood. And I love how it says there in verse 28, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Do you realize that God put on human frailty and came and died on the cross for our sins? so that we could be saved. I love that. We have that kind of a savior who was willing to take the pain and to take the punishment that we deserve so that we could be spared from his everlasting punishment. And now Paul is saying, hey, look, these are God's sheep. And you're an elder. You better take care of God's sheep. As an overseer, as a shepherd, Paul is encouraging these elders to make sure that they understand, hey, these aren't your sheep. These are God's sheep. He purchased them with his blood. 
Paul warned them, hey, look, there's going to be these wolves who are going to come in, and they're going to try to deceive those whom the Lord has purchased with his blood. Paul even warned them that there was also going to be these deceivers who would rise up within their own ranks. And according to Paul, these so-called saints would be speaking perverse things by distorting the truth. They'll do this with the intentions of finding a few followers who will fall for their false doctrines. It's for this reason that Paul spent three years there in Ephesus. And throughout those three years, he constantly warned the elders in Ephesus about these wolves who would sneak in wearing sheep's clothing. These ravenous wolves that would wrap themselves in the wool of sheep so that they could smell like sheep and look like sheep and sneak in and destroy these churches. I believe that that's still the case today, that nothing has changed, that there are ravenous wolves who are trying to creep into this church and that there will be those, even from our own ranks, will rise up and speak perverse things. It's for this reason that I'm constantly on the lookout for those who are attempting to bring heresy into the church. And Christian, please understand that in light of the growing apostasy which is happening in the church today, I take Paul's encouragement here in this text very seriously. According to Paul's encouragement, I know what my job is as the elder of this church. I know that it's my job to protect this flock from the wolves who will come in disguised in sheep's clothing. Not only that, but according to Paul's challenge, I should also be on the lookout for those who are going to rise up from among us and speak perverse things so that they can split the church. You better believe that I take ownership of Paul's encouragement because I know how much Jesus loves the church which he purchased with his blood. You see, I'm the overseer of this church. I'm the shepherd of this church by, by God's design. And I recognize that you are his sheep. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not messing around with God's sheep. I'm not here to fleece the flock. I'm not here to, to make me feel good about me. God has called me to come and be an overseer and a protector so that I can guard the sheep of this flock from the heresies that are out there. I would also argue that every Christian leader has been called to have the same heart for the people that they're leading. So this isn't true just of me and this church, but, but every Christian pastor in the world today should have this same heart to protect the sheep of God from these heresies. I would go further and say that this ought to be true of every leader here within this church. Regardless of whether you're a small group leader or overseeing a larger ministry, it's your job to make sure that you're protecting those believers from false teachers who are attempting to damage the church with heresy and by causing division. Furthermore, Paul also helps us see how Christians should no longer be greedy for gain. And with this is our focus, if you would look with me beginning at verse 32, there Paul declares, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Here in these verses, we find Paul reminding these elders that he had gone out of his way working as a tent maker. And he did this so that he might not be a financial burden on the new believers there in Ephesus. Remember, this church, well, he planted it and he was there for the first three years. He didn't want to be a financial burden on this new church. He didn't want to be a financial burden on these new believers. And in this way, Paul was reminding the elders there in Ephesus, of his example. He was helping them to understand that good Christian leaders aren't greedy for gain. They would rather give than receive. Now understand that this is not to suggest that Paul was opposed to the practice of established healthy churches providing financial compensation for their full-time ministers. To the contrary, 
Paul actually told the Christians in Corinth that those who have been called to full-time ministry should be able to make a living as they serve in this full-time role. As a matter of fact, you can read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 for homework. You might pay attention to verse 11 where Paul asks, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? Paul's saying, hey, you know, we've dedicated our time to ministering to you in a full-time capacity. Is it any great thing for you to turn around and compensate the full-time minister financially? Clearly, Paul is a man who believed that the church should provide their full-time ministers with a living wage. Yet at the same time, Paul was telling these elders that they must not be greedy for gain. And he's basically saying that, yes, the church should be supporting you financially, but don't use that as a way of fleecing the flock and getting rich off the ministry. The reason I say this is because, you know, the church has been called to not only provide for full-time ministers, but also to care for those who are extremely poor. And if the leader of the church, if the pastor of the church is greedy for gain, then they might take all that money for themselves and there's nothing left over for the benevolence ministry. That being the case, Paul's saying, hey, not only should you be provided for, but you also need to make sure that you're caring for the poor. Therefore, you need to have a heart, a heart that says, much like the Lord, it's better to give than to receive. Based on this, we can see then that Christian leaders must believe and have a heart that is benevolent. We must believe in benevolence, and we must have a heart that says, I would rather support the poor than, than take a pay raise. We must understand that the Lord's heart is to care for those who can't care for themselves. Therefore, Christian leaders must be benevolent. According to the example of Paul, I, I encourage you, be leery of any Christian leader who is showing themselves to be greedy for gain. Be leery of those leaders who are just begging and begging and begging for more money. And then you see them living in a gated community and driving the nicest cars and wearing these expensive tailor-made suits and I just don't think that that's the example of being a benevolent leader. Well, finally, we should also consider Paul's example in departing uh, from this area. And, and we see the, the, in the final verses, Paul is now departing uh, from these leaders there in Ephesus. With this in mind, look with me there at verse 36. There Luke writes, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely. And fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Here in the final verses of this chapter, we find the sorrowful departure of Paul. And though Paul spent three years developing these men to, to be able to lead the church there in Ephesus, well, he was also a man who understood that his season there in Ephesus was over. He planted the church there, he established the church, he raised up these leaders there in Ephesus, but he also realized that this season of his life was over. Though Paul's departure brought many tears to the eyes of these leaders, Paul also knew that it was time for him to focus on the next season of his ministry. And just like that, Paul was gone. Based on Paul's example, I would point out that Christian leaders are those who recognize when it's time to switch gears. That they know when, when this ministry is done and the next ministry is ready to go and, and they understand what the Lord is calling them to do. And while it's true that there are seasons of life which we wish would never end, it's also true that those who want to lead must also be ready to make those tough decisions to recognize that this season is over. It's time to move to the next stage. Without a doubt, as we consider everything that we find here in our text, Christian leadership is tough. And there's a lot on the list of what it means to be a good Christian leader. And yet at the same time, I would point out that the highest calling that any person could ever receive here in this world is Christian leadership. Th imagine the, the most respectable, honorable job on the planet, and I'll tell you that Christian leadership is higher. And the reason why is because the things that we're dealing with are eternal. 
Christian leadership is all about the eternal perspective and leading people into an everlasting relationship with our Lord and Savior. Therefore, if God has called you into a Christian leadership position here within our church, then I encourage you, study Paul's example. Because Paul said, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Paul's saying, I am the right example of what a Christian leader should look like. Therefore, if you want to be a good Christian leader, look at Paul's example. And ask the Lord to help you to follow in his footsteps. But maybe you're here tonight and the Lord hasn't called you into a leadership position, or maybe just not yet. And you're wondering, well, how does this apply to me? Well, if that describes you, then I would just point out that Paul's example of Christian leadership found here in our text tonight will help you to discern between those who are truly leading in the right way and those who are only leading people after themselves. You see, there are many people in the church and outside of the church who want to lead you. Now I just encourage you, take Paul's example. And, and if they're failing in a major way, I mean, we're all gonna fail, right? But if they don't even believe in these things and they're not even trying to apply these truths to their life and they're not walking as, as, as the sort of leader that Paul was, don't let them lead you anywhere. Don't let them lead you to H-E-B. Because they're not a good leader, biblically speaking. We have to be looking for those leaders who, like Paul, set out to, by the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit, accomplish leadership in a very biblical way. 